seeing your 3D objects come to life is really satisfying. In this lesson, I'll walk you through the basics of Blender's powerful animation system. We control our objects moving through the X, Y, and Z axes in the 3D view, of course, and we control our objects moving through time in our timeline. Here we have a playhead where we can play and pause and skip through our animation, and we can also click and drag on the area right below that where our frames are listed to scrub through the timeline. To animate an object, we just need to tell Blender where an object should be at a particular point in time. So if we wanted to move our cube forward along the x-axis, we would just need to tell it exactly where and when to start and stop. Let's just have it start on frame 1. To tell Blender this is exactly where it should be on that frame, we need to set a keyframe. Key in this case meaning important. To do that, we just need to go to the Object menu, down to Animation, and choose Insert Keyframe. That'll bring up a list of all of the different transformation properties that we could add a keyframe to, and for now, let's just choose Location. Now Blender knows that on frame 1, the cube should be at exactly 0, 0, 0. This means that if we move our cube anywhere else, and then update our timeline, the cube's going to snap back to 0, 0, 0, because we've explicitly told it to be there, and haven't told it to be anywhere else. So since we haven't set any other keyframes, Blender's just going to keep this cube at 0, 0, 0 for all eternity. Now let's fast forward to something like frame 50, and move our cube along the x-axis. I'll take my Move tool, move it forward, and I'll hold down Control to move in even increments here, and I'll move it about 10 meters. Then to make sure that this transformation is saved, I'll go back to Object, Animation, and Insert Keyframe, and again choose Location. Over in the Properties Editor, these properties have changed color. When the keyframe is set for the frame we're on, we'll get this orangish color, and we'll also get this filled in keyframe icon over on the right. If I were to move back a couple frames, then the green and the empty keyframe indicates that this property is animated, but it's not currently on a keyframe. Let's also learn how to set a keyframe in the Properties Editor. I'll go back to frame 1 here just by skipping to the beginning of my animation, and I'd rather this slide along the floor rather than through the middle of it, so I'll go to the Z value and set that to 1. Now this already has a keyframe on it, but I could go ahead and double click that in order to reset that as a keyframe, or I can always also hover over the property and just hit I to insert keyframe. That's the same hotkey as the 3D view to bring up the insert keyframe menu. So now it starts on top of the floor, and then on frame 50, it's back down underneath. So I'll also set this to frame 1 on the Z axis, and with my mouse still hovering over it, I'll just hit I. There we go, now it slides around on top of the floor. You might have animated properties all throughout the Properties Editor, and you probably don't want to be digging through all these menus every time you want to change your animation. So you can also edit all of these properties individually in the timeline. To do that, just left click on the top of the timeline and drag upwards to give ourselves a little bit more space. Then head to the left and click this tiny arrow to bring up the Channels menu. Here we'll see that the two keyframes that we're currently seeing are just the summary, but we can expand that and look at all of the keyframes on our cube object, all of the keyframes inside our cube object's action, which is where all the keyframes are stored, but objects can also have multiple actions, though that's a topic for another day. Then I'll expand object transformations, and now we can see the individual keys for the X, Y, and Z locations. This bar in between two keyframes means that there's no change. So since Z starts on one and ends at one, it's gonna hold that value throughout this entire time. Now, if I wanted to move my cube along the Y axis, and have it slide over here instead, then I'd have to animate both of these properties. But since I'm not really using the Y location, I may as well go ahead and delete these keyframes. I'll shift select both of them, and then just hit delete. Now I'm only animated along my X and Z axis, and I can move this wherever I want along the Y, and still get the animation along the X that I'm looking for. If you're already familiar with animation, one thing that you're probably going to be looking for is the graph editor. We can get to that by switching from our timeline to the graph editor, which is just below it in the editor list. Or we can always get to it from the other animation editors just by hitting control tab. So if I hit control tab, I can go back to the timeline and hit control tab, I'm back in the graph editor. Now, if you've never worked with animation curves, I can understand that it can be a little bit intimidating, but the way that it works is actually super simple. Here, I'll give myself a little bit more space to work and I'll expand our object transforms so that we can see our Z location which if we double click on that and hit period on our number pad to frame selected or go to view and frame selected, then we'll see that we have a flat line for the Z location because there's no change whatsoever. However, if I double click on my X location and then again hit period on my number pad, then I get this slightly S shaped curve. Here you'll see that on frame one, the cube's X location has a value of zero 
and then on frame 50, the cube's X location has a value of 10. We've only set those two positions, but this curve is how Blender transitions in between them. So we can see that on frame 30, the X location is going to be around 6. And if we go to frame 30 to check it out, then that's exactly the case. So we use the graph editor to see and control exactly how Blender transitions in between our keyframes. If I wanted the ease in and ease out to be a little bit more extreme here, then I could select the handle right at the beginning and hit S to scale that up. Then I'll take the second keyframe up here and again hit S to scale that up. So now it'll start out really smoothly, then it'll start moving really fast, and then it'll ease out again. And let's play that back to see it. I don't think we need to get too deep in the graph editor here though, so I'll switch back to my timeline. I do think we can make this animation a little more interesting though. I'll set the end frame to frame 60, and that way when I play it back it'll just loop through this section. And let's give this cube a little bit more life. So I'd like to give it a little bit of anticipation by moving it backwards a little bit before it moves forwards. So I'll go to frame 10 here, and just move it back. Now I don't really want to have to insert a keyframe every single time. So what I'll do is turn on this record button in the timeline, which turns on auto keyframing. If I were to play my animation and start moving this around, then it would record all of those movements. But I don't want to do that here, I just want to simply move this back a little bit. So with auto keyframing on, I'll just move this back along the X until the initial movement is just a slight backwards push. Now there's a little hesitation, and it shoots off. I can also do the same thing for the ending. I'll zoom in here on my timeline. And about 10 frames before it gets to the end, I'll move it just slightly past its value of 10. Now it has just a slight bounce at the end, though it's maybe a little bit extreme. So I'll pull that back a bit. All right, well, with this, I'm sure you could guess how to animate the rotation or the scale of this cube. But one of the coolest things about Blender is that we can animate almost any property. For example, we could go to the Material tab and animate the base color. On frame 10, I'll set it to a blue and just click this little dot on the right to insert a keyframe. Then on frame 40, I'll switch this to a green. Since I have auto keyframing on, then that change has been saved automatically. Now if I go to Material Preview and play this back, then it smoothly transitions between these two colors. If I'm not happy with how they transition, then I could just go to somewhere in the middle and pick a different color from this teal. Let's say I want it to go around the other way in the color wheel, so I'll set this to a red. This way we can not only animate the transforms of our object, but all of its material and texture properties, as well as its modifiers or constraints or physics properties, or basically anything else in Blender. Now to render out this animation, first I'll set my camera to somewhere where I can see the whole thing. I'll navigate my viewport to where I can see it cross from one side to the other, and then hit Control Alt Number Pad 0, or go to View, Align View, and Align Active Camera to View. Then I'll select my camera, hit G, double tap Z, and just zoom this out a little bit. All right, now I can see the whole thing. And to render this out as a movie, I'll go to the output properties and just set the file format from an image to a movie format like FFmpeg. Images don't get saved out automatically at the output path, but movies do. So let's specify that here. I'll just put this in my video folder and I'll call it cube. Then I'll go up to render and render animation. Now it's going to step through every single frame until it's completely finished. And then to view it, we could just open it up in any video player or go to render and view animation. This might be an incredibly basic example, but this same idea of changing individual properties over time with keyframes is exactly how most 3D animation is made. To check out how to go from this to animating something much more complex like a character, check out Wayne Dixon's really helpful beginner animation courses on CG Cookie. For now though, just try animating something simple, and then in the next lesson, we'll take a look at 2D animation. 